Hello everyone, and welcome to the Blu-ray Disc Virtual Roundtable. My name is Andy Parsons, and I am the chair of the U.S. Promotion Committee for the Blu-ray Disc Association, and we're here today to talk about Blu-ray 3D. And uh, we have a great opportunity to uh, have a, a guest from uh, 20th Century Fox, Mr. Ian Harvey. And Ian is the Senior Vice President of Advanced Technology for Fox Film Entertainment. Um, it is a very good opportunity to discuss uh, 3D on Blu-ray today because Fox has just released a new title, Blu-ray 3D title, uh, iRobot. Uh, I believe it just came out yesterday. Um, and what makes this really interesting is not only is it a Blu-ray 3D title, but it's one that was previously released as a 2D title, one that was a standard you know, two-dimensional title about eight years ago. And so um, one of the things we wanted to talk about today was the process that's involved with uh, taking a 2D title and, and turning it into 3D, uh, which is something that's uh, progressed quite a lot in the last few years as far as uh, their ability to do that well and convincingly. Um, but before we get into that, I thought I would ask Ian to kind of go over some basics with us about 3D and how it's accomplished because it's something that um, is pretty magical when you've actually seen a good demo of it. It's uh, good 3D is just uh, amazing. Um, so Ian, can you give us kind of a quick idea of what's involved with 3D and how we make it work? Sure, sure. So fundamentally we have to take a 2D image. Um, this is a 2D image of iRobot. Um, and we have to create two views of that, slightly different from each other so that your right eye sees something different than your left eye. Um, just as you would in the real world, um, you have to see that difference between the two eyes for your brain to comprehend the 3D. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a flat screen. There is no 3D associated with it. And so we have to uh, convince your brain that there's actually a difference between the two images. So when you're shooting that with a camera, that's fine. You have two cameras. You can capture the two images. However, when you're converting a 2D, you have to take um, the 2D image um, bring out the, the points that you want to have in three dimensions mm -hmm. um, and pray a view for the left eye and a view for the right eye. I mean, historically that's been done red-green glasses. Right, I think right. Everybody has seen those. Um, there are polarized glasses, uh, more commonly used in the, in the theater, but again, some of them uh, for the home. In this case today, we're looking at a Panasonic monitor with uh, active glasses, so shutter glasses synchronized uh, full screen left eye with the left eye lens open, full screen right eye with the right eye. Open. And that's just happening so fast you can't really perceive it, right? Correct. Um, it's, it's so fast that your brain doesn't perceive that there's actually two images. Your brain thinks you see one, uh, the left eye seeing something slightly different than the right, therefore you can therefore see the 3D. I see. So it seems like when you take something that was originally shot in 2D and now you want to convert it into a very convincing 3D, that must be a pretty complicated process. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, it, it, that's a fair statement. Um, there's, there's varying amounts of work that need to be done depending on the quality that you're trying to get. I think we've achieved a very good quality with this movie. Mm -hmm. um, we've used a GVC conversion tool that we've partnered with them over the last uh, almost two years to, to improve, to get to the quality levels that we have. Um, basically what we have to do is go through the complete movie, um, understand how we want the 3D to look. So basically create a depth script for the movie. This was shot in 2D. There are a tremendous number of scenes like this one where clearly he's jumping forward mm -hmm. towards the viewer. Right. And so we can emphasize that in the 3D conversion. So what I'm going to walk through this morning is, is how we actually do that. Um, so after we have the depth script and we identify that we want the robot to be coming forward, if you look behind them, there's a, a view into a room that's behind um, him through the broken window. And then these dark areas are obviously in 3D. Um, that's a screensaver. That's a screensaver. Right. So what we need to do uh, to be able to create the 3D is we have to identify the elements that we want brought out into 3D. And for that, we create what, what we have as rough roto. That's this image. From that, we're going to create an individual roto mat of the image. So we provide this as a guideline. In this case, you see two. You see the pink of the robot, and you see the blue of the window. Those are uh, instructions to the roto artist who's then going to create 
this image for the robot and this image for the window. So you're creating two different layers in effect, right? By doing yeah, this. so multiple layers, in this case three. Um, so again, these are the images that you that you use um, to create the depth. Now you have to do this now, frame by frame, right? Yeah, so the point I was going to bring out now is, so this is one frame uh, of this shot, and for every frame as he jumps, we need the uh, um, the mats made for that, yeah. for those objects. And what we do then is we separate those objects for right eye and left eye, and then we have to fill in the missing data. Because obviously now I've created two images, there's missing data that, was not, that wasn't captured in the 2D version, and that has to be created. Mm. In our case, um, that's very much created by the conversion tool itself, so it's automated. And so we are able to then um, get through the conversions uh, quickly and uh, provide a great deal of um, automation to the process. Currently, that would be done by hand by somebody painting in pixels. So it, it seems like to do the difference between maybe good 3D and not so good 3D when you're doing conversion is this, there must be sort of an art to this, right? I mean, people have to make decisions still, right? There's a human Absolutely. aspect or element to this to make sure that the effect is convincing and that it gets the effect that you really want uh, for maximum impact. Um, so you've indicated there's some automated tools, but I imagine there must still be a lot of you know, personal involvement with the process. There are, because the automated tools don't always make the right decision. So the first step in the process is to create this depth script. The second step in the process is to create this roto so that we get the masks that we need. The third step, which I'm going to show you now, is actually to look at, so this image here, um, if I flip back and forth, you should see, so this is the left eye image, this is the original left eye, and this is the right eye created image. So if you look, you can see that the robot is actually shifted. So this is the left eye, the original. This is the right eye with the robot shifted. The way to look is if you look at this vertical line. Mm -hmm. In the previous version, the left eye, he's much closer to it. In the right eye, he's further from it. So you have a shift in the robot, which is going to provide the depth. Now in this case, what we're pointing out is that the image created has some artifacts around his knee here and around his arm. Mm -hmm. Unless we clean those up, which is this is the cleaned up version, this is the non-cleaned up version, I think you can clearly see that the vertical line is much cleaner than it is in the original. Right. So that's an error made by the tool. Ah, okay. That is then manually corrected, and that's typically known as paint. So the tool does a great job of filling in lots of the areas, but in cases of things like vertical lines, you do see areas where you have to fix. Now, if you don't fix those, you end up with bad 3D. Mm -hmm. um, we fix them, so we end up with a result that I think is, is very pleasing to the eye, very natural. I see. Um, we, and the less of those distortions or artifacts that you have in the final product is the value, the, the quality level that you achieve. A good 3D as we would think of it, right? Yeah, good 3D. I see. Think. So it's really very interesting because one of the things also that I always wonder about is how you make the decisions about the 3D effects being something that either looks natural or sometimes, you know, some I remember some of the older 3D films from the 1950s where they had these really exaggerated 3D effects. Yeah. I imagine there's some balance you have to apply there as well to make sure that it looks natural but not like too much in your face or do you actually like the exaggerated effects from time to time? Well, I think we try to have a natural view um, to our to our movies. If you look at you know the movies that we've released, I mean Avatar being the, the, the prime example of it, we're sort of looking into a world. Um, we don't have too many things jumping out at you. There are definitely shots where you want to emphasize that mm -hmm. to give it a special effect, um, but mostly we're, we're looking at a natural effect. So when you look at this in 3D, I think you'll see that the characters look very natural. They don't look cardboard cut out, which you see in many yeah. um, 
not so good conversions, let's just put it that way. Mm. Uh, we don't have that same cardboard cutout look. We've, we've done, a, a, I think, a pretty good job of providing a very natural 3D uh, view for the consumer. Okay. And, you know, how we pick the movies, obviously, something like iRobot was a, a very popular movie with a fan base. Um, I think it was done before its time. It should have been 3D. Um, you know, there are lots of images like this of major 3D events throughout the movie that we've been able to take advantage of to provide, you know, the, the fan and the new fan um, a 3D experience that sort of emphasizes the film. So this sort of changes the whole feel of the film, the whole experience of the film, and you can watch it, especially a film you're familiar with and you've seen probably a dozen times, now you get a chance to see it in a completely different way if you want. You know, exactly. 3D, right? You get to see it in 3D, you get to see all those shots where you have to imagine the 3D, you actually can now experience the 3D. And for new viewers, you know, it's it's a great movie to to enjoy to begin with, and now with the, the 3D effects, I think we can we can bring in new people to the audience as well. That's great. You know, one of the things that we are always eager to see more of is more and more 3D titles coming to market. And I think one of the reasons why this whole idea of conversion is uh, being looked at so closely is because if we're dependent only on new releases to be able to grow the catalog, yeah. that's going to be a relatively slow growth pace. Um, the idea of taking this enormous catalog of content that you have available to you and then carefully selecting the films that you think are the right ones for this process, that allows us to build up our library a lot faster. I mean, that's really the holy grail here, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, correct. I mean, 3D really needs content as well as devices. I mean, we have displays, we have, we have Blu-ray players. Uh, that can provide the real high value content and great experience for people. We need to get more content. And so this is Fox's way of, of uh, enabling that to take, you know, as you pointed out, great titles from our library and being able to present them to the new user of 3D in the home. That's, that's very good. Um, it's, I can't wait to see it in 3D. It's, uh, I haven't seen the film since it first came out, so it must be a completely different experience. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other aspects of this when you talk about good 3D versus bad 3D? I know you pointed out mm -hmm. the artifacts and things like yeah. that. Are there other decisions that you have to make? You mentioned before a depth script, for example. That's right. something that, that uh, it seems like there's a lot of know-how involved with that process. Yeah, I mean, that's a trade-off of trying to, to provide a, a great experience to the consumer, or some you know artistic view of it, but also the capabilities of the technology. Um, as the technology improves, you'll be able to do more and more and more. Um, we've, we've been able to provide a very good experience um, with the technology today. We're still improving it. Um, so, you know, as additional titles are converted, I think you'll see even more and more uh, improvement to the process. Uh, th there is one other step I'd like to talk about. This is a little difficult to view in, in uh, 2D, but this is a great shot, a shotgun blast. Uh, you have pieces of glass blown all over the place. Mm. You have sparks. The conversion does a fairly good job of that, gives you a nice experience. But this is a key scene, this is a shotgun blast. This is maybe one of those places where you do expect a little bit more coming out at you. Um, we actually went in and, and took elements that are already in the scene. So if you look at the sparks, if you look at the glass that's flying, mm -hmm. take those elements and we enhance them a little bit um, by adding some CGI. So they naturally fit within the uh, within the scene. So this is the original. This is the added CGI. And when you look at the final, where you composite both, now you have elements where um, you can take the CGI and bring that further out in 3D. So that in this, excuse me, remote's not doing quite what I expected it to do. Okay, so you can see the sparks here. We bring those out even further. These added elements, we bring those out even further. So when the shotgun blast happens, you have the conversion that we've done, but we also have the ability to add to that conversion. I see. So is this what's involved when you talk about that depth script of seeing these key scenes and making those exactly. decisions of the things you want to really bring out and emphasize? Here's all the things that we want to bring out from a conversion standpoint. Here's some additional things that we want to do. Uh, that's amazing. I mean, it's really come a long way, hasn't it? <laughs> it's just it has. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we 
to for Blu-ray in particular, um, there are there are many ways to convert. Um, let me just get this to a stable position here. There's many ways to convert. We choose to convert from a left eye, create a right eye. Now, the reason we do that is Blu-ray allows you to play back 2D from one of the eyes that you select. So in our release of iRobot, you can actually put the 3D disc into a 2D player and still experience the 2D. Right. That's, that's so great. we're using Blu-ray for you know the high quality experience, the very high bit rates that we can provide through the physical media. Um, you could provide this through a streamed environment. I was going to ask this question. You, you beat me to it, so that's good. <laughs> so you, you could provide this through a streamed environment, but the bit rates are not going to match the, the quality levels that, that we can achieve with Blu-ray. So Blu-ray is still a very effective means for us to distribute this. Uh, OK, I mean, that's one of the key points we've been trying to make uh, over and over again, is that you know there are things that packaged media can do because of that very lavish bit rate you have available to you. That you know, when you think about a streaming network, where they're actually kind of work in the opposite direction, the lower they can get the bit rate, then the happier they are, right? Because they can get more content down the pipe and all of that. Um, whereas with Blu-ray, you've just got that one single channel in effect to be able to um, to focus on, and you've got you know a huge amount of bits compared to what a typical household can deliver in, in a streaming environment. So that allows you to deliver the quality you're after. Um, it's hard to imagine doing that on a streaming system at this point in time. Is that a fair statement? Or I think that is a fair statement. I think there's one other point about it. I mean, Blu-ray is, uh, it's obviously there's two images. Um, you have to provide those two images. Blu-ray provides full screen 1080 per eye. Mm -hmm. um, in a streaming environment, you don't have that decoder available to you. So you actually have to uh, stream side by side. So yes, not only do you have lower bit rates, but you actually have lower resolution because you have half resolution. So the left eye and right eye are contained within one frame. So you don't right. have full 1920 by 1080. Right. right. You have half resolution. Um, so that's something else that you know we prefer to provide this from a Blu-ray standpoint because we have very high bit rates. We have full frame 1080 uh, available to the consumer. Well, it looks like a very convincing uh, title. I'm really excited to see it. It just came out yesterday, uh, iRobot in 3D on Blu-ray 3D. Um, I think that pretty much wraps up our video portion, unless there's anything else you wanted to add at the end. Okay. Go buy it and take a look at it, I guess. That's so the thing. Th thank you, Ian. So the next step that we'll do is the, uh, the uh, Q&A section, and we'll do that as we always do through a chat session. So we're going to go off camera now, and we'll do the Q&A. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been fascinating learning about 3D uh, and how that's done, especially on the conversion side. Um, so until next time, thank you very much for being here.